Hi, I'm Joe Diaguardi, the founder of Truth in Government. Truth in Government is committed to telling you the truth about government spending. And the way that has to be done is to bring principles that have been promulgated in the accounting profession by professionals over the years to government. It's not being done today. And as a result, Congress especially is getting away without the standards that we need to tell you the truth about real government spending. So Truth in Government wants to bring accountability, fiscal responsibility, transparency, the rules that the Security and Exchange Commission imposes on publicly traded companies to the U.S. government. And that will stop the Congress from lying to you about what is really going on with the federal deficits and the national debt. In August of 1994, as a keynote speaker at the annual conference of the American Accounting Association, Joe persuaded professors of accounting to play an active role in federal budgeting and financial management reform. In June 2003, the National Law Journal published another of Joe's articles, Cooking the Nation's Books, in which he makes the case that Washington uses the same misleading, I would say fraudulent, accounting devices and financial reporting practices that Enron used to create artificial agents and earnings and to hide debt on a massive scale. Joe's going to talk to us today about what he calls a subprime national debt. We are most grateful and honored that Joe has taken time from his busy schedule to be with us today. Let's give him a very warm rotary welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. I am so happy to be back. I think this is the fourth time I have spoken at the Manhattan Rotary in the last seven years. And uh, let me say that I am a Paul Harris Fellow, but I forgot to bring my pen today. But I'm very uh, honored that I did get that honor back as a congressman in 1988, the people in my district, seeing that I was trying to change things thought that I represented the spirit of the Rotary in the way I approached Main Street, trying to help the people. Uh, you don't, probably don't know my full background, but if you want to, it's uh, in the back of this little book. Do, do each one of you have this book with a letter from George Bush one to me in 1991? The reason for that letter is that I worked four years in Congress to pass a bill to bring chief financial officers to every one of the U.S. agencies and departments. There are 28 of them. Now you might say, well, I can't believe it. We didn't have CFOs. No. We had a OMB director, Office of Management Budget. You had the GAO, the government, the Controller General. You had the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO. You had the Treasury Department. But believe it or not, as soon as I hit Congress, as the first practicing certified public accountant ever elected to the U.S. Congress, House or Senate, the first thing I noticed is that the numbers were meaningless. Numbers were being just shoveled around and people were being kind of um, seduced into thinking that there was accountability. But I realized there's a big difference between bookkeeping and real accounting that CPAs bring to bear. Bookkeeping is just putting numbers on a page or in a register, adding them up and giving them without even checking them. A CPA has to make sense of those numbers. That's called financial management. What do these numbers mean? How should they be presented? How should these numbers get funneled into the management process in government? Do we have audits to make sure that these numbers are accurate? That's what a chief financial officer does. That's what a certified public accountant does. And you'll see, after four years, and I was a junior member of the minority party. Not easy to do this. I broke the door down. But unfortunately, I was a Republican elected in a very Democratic district. I was only able to hold it two terms when the governor redistricted me. That's what happens. Even when you try to do a good job, politics intervenes. And my district goes from Westchester into Queens. So I'm now forced to go to Queens in a district that obviously didn't know who I was. And even then, I almost won. I got 45%. But the point is, I didn't stop my work. That's why I started Truth in Government. 
because I felt this work was too important. And here is George Bush one sending me a letter saying, Joe, and dear Joe, why dear Joe? Well, he campaigned with me as vice president with his wife, Barbara, because she was born in Rye, in my district. So they knocked door to door with me uh, during my campaign, first one in 1984. So I got to know the family. But here he's signing my bill and saying, I'm so sorry you're not here, but I know what you did. So he signed that bill. So at least we know we have a chief financial officer now in every department and agency. But guess what they did? Typical Congress, they didn't implement the bill as I had written it. This was supposed to be an independent entity or group or commission, just like the Controller General, who has a 15-year term, cannot be fired. And it's not coterminous with the presidential uh, election. The CFO, the big one, and the ones in each agency were supposed to not be political hacks. So instead of putting them in a separate commission, they put the Chief Financial Officer under the Treasury Secretary. And I wrote an editorial that appeared in the Washington Post, Washington Times. That's like putting the fox in the chicken coop. You know what happens when you get up the next morning? There's no chickens. And in effect, we did not. We created, in effect, a conflict of interest because the Treasury Secretary has interests that are political that are not the interests that a chief financial officer will be looking at who represents the people. What is the best analogy for this? It's the boards of the corporations representing the companies that you will own stocks in. The management doesn't hire the accountants. It's the board of directors. In fact, they used to, but then we had a strict law coming in called Sarbanes-Oxley, and now you need independent directors. You certainly need independent directors and the CPA for the chairman of the audit committee. Well, these are the things we should bring to government. A little housekeeping before I go too, too much further. Last year, I guess it was the year before, Larry Parks reminded Shirley that we spoke about our work in the Balkans, human rights. Shirley and I just came back from Kosovo, I'd say it was in the summer, July, and she wrote an excellent report on what's going on there. But since the time you, we spoke, we now have a new state. Not easy to create a new state. I started that in 1985. And Shirley, when we met in 1993, she's a former publisher, we got together and we made this a cause celeb as volunteers, and we started, just like Truth in Government, the Albanian American Foundation and the Albanian American Civic League. The proof is in the pudding. It's the first new state in 18 years. It's called Kosovo. That happened on February 17th. Unfortunately, Russia and Serbia are playing games, and they're preventing it from being recognized in the United Nations. So they're trying to marginalize the state. And as you know, if you can't have an economy, you are independent in name only. And without membership in the United Nations, money from the World Bank, so you can rebuild the infrastructure, create the electricity you need so people will invest in factories to create the jobs, you really can't have a good state. So we're working on that. But if any of you have an interest in that, Shirley's here. She'll give you her card. You give her your card, and she'll send you the report she wrote, Kosovo Adrift. I also wrote a report on what's going on in general with the Albanian people, if you like that. We could send that to you, too. Shirley Cloyes. Thank you for coming, Shirley. Now, to get something else out of the way, uh, yes, that is my daughter, Kara, who was named the fourth judge on American Idol. But don't ask me for tickets. <laughs> I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> A lot of people, now I'm going to be known as Kara's dad, no longer as former Congressman Jody Aguardi. She is a songwriter. Now, where do we stand today? You have this booklet. Open it up to the middle folder. And you'll see the article I am most proud of. It's the article that I wrote entitled, Cooking the Nation's Books. Now, why is this article important for you? Because I don't want you to believe me because I happen to have been a former congressman and I'm an accountant. I want you to know that people who should know better would not print this article if they didn't think it was true. Because this article is not by a political journal or a CPA journal. This article is by the National Law Journal, and they had to vet every word that I said. This goes to 30,000 attorneys, and they couldn't believe what I was saying. And let me tell you what I said in here. Not only are the books of the United States worse than Enron's, they are an illegal set of books. Now, you might say, how could they be illegal? This is the US government. It is illegal, but you haven't forced your Congress to implement a law that was passed in 1951 for the first time, and 1955 for the second time. 
The first Hoover Commission, signed by Truman, mandated the accrual basis of accounting, the one that the SEC imposes on publicly traded companies. So you are not defrauded as a shareholder. It didn't happen. They had a second Hoover Commission, 1955. Read it. The public law is cited. And Eisenhower signed it and gave the Congress five years to implement the right accounting system called the accrual basis, generally accepted accounting principles. They still haven't done it. Now, doesn't that get you mad? It should. Because what I'm about to tell you, you think the problems are on Wall Street? All right, let's go to the numbers. The national debt of the United States of America, as publicized before the bailout, was $9.3 trillion. That's with a T. With the bailout, as you know, 700, and guess what? They added another 120, 150 of sweeteners called earmarks, the pork, because some members had to be incented to vote for the bill. Now, isn't that crazy? At a time when America is bleeding, somebody had the nerve to add pork, that is somebody that either is delusional or has a very, very safe seat, one or the other. Because to me, it's incredible that anybody in these times would add anything to that amount, which, by the way, has to be borrowed. We don't have that money. It's probably going to be borrowed from the Chinese. And if not the Chinese, it's probably going to be printed. And if it's printed, what happens? Ask Larry Parks. Inflation, OK? So we have a, a, a lot of problems going on. But in any case, the real debt right now on a cash basis is 10 point something trillion. But that's not the real problem. The real problem is that since we're not on the accrual basis and we're on the cash basis, and let me give you accounting 101. The cash basis is the system you use to balance your checkbook. When you write a check, you say, I have an expense. I can deduct it for tax purposes. The accrual basis says it's not necessary for you to write a check to have an expense. If you are obligated to pay something and that liability is fixed and determinable, that has to be put on your books now, even though you didn't spend the money. And on the other hand, if you have a right to receive something, an account receivable, even though you didn't get the cash, that's income. That's the way corporate America keeps its books. And that's the way the US government should be keeping its books. Why? Because that's the system that government imposes on you. Why the double standard? If the Securities and Exchange Commission imposes that system, and it had the Sarbanes-Oxley law to really put teeth in it, on corporations to protect shareholders, why are we using the same system to protect taxpayers? Can anybody tell me? No, you can't. But yet we're sitting here saying, how could this happen? Now, let me give you the really bad news. The really bad news is that if you add up the liabilities for many things, student loans, you name it, mortgages, of course, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, what about Medicare? What about Social Security? Just for Medicare and Social Security and military pensions, the unfunded, unfunded means we don't have the cash. But worse than that, unrecorded. We haven't put it on the books as a liability. It's $53 trillion. That's with a T. Now, if you don't believe me, go get the issue of the Times three weeks ago. Pete Peterson, billionaire, started a foundation, the Pete Peterson Foundation. He hired away the most important person we had in the government, a former partner of mine, David Walker. He was the Controller General. He had another five years to go on his term. You can imagine what he got paid. He left. He's with Pete Peterson to do exactly what I'm here telling you. That's what they got to do. They took a two-page ad out in Section A of the Times, both sides, and the first thing they said was that, that our Medicare and Social Security unfunded, they didn't say unrecorded. They should have said that, too, because nobody knows it. It's $53 trillion. That's a big, big number. And that's not all of it. Because if you look at government-sponsored enterprises, you've heard that name, GSE. Why did you hear that name? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. That's only two of them. There were 29 of them. The farm credit system, the Resolution Trust Corporation, 
Remember the SNL crisis? Uh, another big one, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. When a company goes out of business, they then lay off their pension obligations on the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, and I can tell you right now, if there was an audit, there's not enough money to cover the liabilities they've picked up, even though they, they have an insurance program. So I want you, if you read nothing else, please read the middle of this book, and you'll see in very simple language why Enron went under and why we have to worry about the United States of America. You know, the biggest problem with Enron was that it had off-the-book entities. They were called SPEs, Special Purpose Entities. Well, we have them in the federal government. They're called GSEs, Government Sponsored Enterprises. And guess what they called them in New York State? Because New York State has a problem just as bad. Authorities, 600 of them off the books with pensions. Why do you think Schwarzenegger now is, is crying uncle like the banks? Do you think he just ran out of money? No, what's happening is revenues are going down and they haven't funded the pensions and he has to pay these pensions. Every one of these states are hiding their real pension obligation, just like the federal government. And now we have to worry about these municipal bonds to see if they're gonna become subprime because this stuff is not on the books. And in New York State, take the MTA, the biggest authority of all. Maybe not, you have the power authority too. I forget which is bigger. Would you believe the deficit of the MTA does not get put on the books of Albany? So Patterson and the group doesn't really look at that. They have to, in effect, float bonds. But what does that tell you? That tells you that they're adding to the debt just like a GSC would. What happens when the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation says, we're out of money, we need money? They float a bond. Full faith and credit of the United States of America, just like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And I remember people telling me when I wrote the book, they were saying to me, and, and look at page 47, when I said, this is not just an implicit guarantee. People are buying these bonds because they think if something happens, the United States is gonna be behind them. Ah, oh, Joe, that'll never happen. There's gonna be mortgages, collateral. Here it is, it's happened, okay? So we gotta start looking at everything. We're in uncharted waters. And speaking of waters, I thought of an image as I was meditating this morning, because I wanted you to get the real picture that would stick with you. It's easy to hear numbers and you walk out, we all have problems and you could forget easily some of these things. I was thinking of the Titanic. That's a terrible thing to think about. But you know, when I think about these congressmen that are trying to keep their seats, I said this one time on the floor of Congress, there, there were no safe rooms on the Titanic. There were no safe districts in America if this country goes under. And yet, every congressman that I knew and know today are worried about getting reelected. Who's thinking about the country? Who's thinking about telling the people the truth about where we're going? And then it dawned on me, we're talking about the bailout of Wall Street, is that good for Main Street? And then I came up with the topic, subprime national debt. The real bailout is yet to come. It's the United States of America. Now, it's not gonna happen overnight because the baby boomers are just now arriving to ask for their social security benefits and Medicare. But is this gonna be a gigantic tax on the next generation because we decided to consume their money? Is this intergenerational equity? Is this what America's all about? My parents were immigrants. My dad wouldn't move from the Bronx to Westchester in 1957 till he had the money in the bank. He wouldn't even take a mortgage on the house because that's how ingrained and you come from poor families and you had to survive, you, you just want to have self-sufficiency. And I never forgot how he just took the money out of the bank and bought that house in 1957. Little did I know I'd be the congressman representing that district uh, 20 years later. But that's America for you, okay? So we have now this issue of a subprime national debt. And the picture that came to mind as we talk about Wall Street and Main Street, do you remember the scene the owner of the Titanic, this arrogant person who risked not only everybody's money, but everybody's life because he wanted to be the first one to reach New York in the least amount of time. Do you remember that? Okay, wasn't that arrogance personified? Greed, don't you think this is what happened on Wall Street? But think about what happened after that. This is the guy that jumped in a boat 
and pushed somebody off the boat. He's the arrogant one that, because he wants to make more money, obviously he wants to advertise, he's got the fastest ships so he can build more. Then when it came time to save the ladies and the children, he took the seat of somebody, hit his head, and went. Is that what, is that what is happening to Main Street today? Is Wall Street now pushing Main Street off the boat? Have we figured out, is this a bailout for Wall Street, or is this good for us? I still don't know. I'm an accountant. I don't know where they got $700 billion from. I don't know how that's going to be dispersed. I don't know what they're going to pay for these subprime mortgages. God forbid they pay face. Some people are going to get very rich. And I see where Mr. Giuliani already has set up another law firm, and Molinari is now joining it, because they want to now get into the, the game of this. So, you know, it, it bothers me. One of the reasons I didn't become a paid lobbyist, I wanted to stick with this message, and I had to have the credibility to do that. Uh, now, let me just go into a couple of other things. Going back to the, the debt. I don't know how we're going to deal with this massive debt. But if we're not honest with America to at least tell them what the dimensions of the debt are, we have actuaries who can certify what the real liability for Social Security is. Every corporation has to do it. Why are we afraid to hire an outside actuary to do it? See what happened in New York State a couple of months ago? The union hired an actuary and convinced the legislature that this was a legitimate actuary and they wanted to change something and the actuary said, it really doesn't cost anything. We found out it cost $200 million. But they accepted this phony actuary paid by the union his determination on what that change would be. And we're doing a lot of that in Washington today. So I wanted to leave you with the message that's on this book. Why did I put on this book a credit card? Because as a congressman, I carried one. And it wasn't Visa or Master Charge. Let me show it to you. Let me show it to you. I probably did this a few years ago, and if you remember it, here it is. It has my picture on it. You know what this is? Anybody tell me what this is? This is a congressman's voting card. A congressman votes. At the end of a row of seats, there's a computer terminal. You put this in, you press green. By a light, uh, yes, a green light goes up. If you press no, a red light. Present, an orange light. I realized when I was putting this in that this was the card creating the deficits and raising the national debt. So I call this, in chapter one of my book, the most expensive credit card in the world, a congressman's voting card. And here on the front cover of the book is a version of the congressional credit line card. Credit line unlimited. Expiration date never. Bill to future generations. Now, if you want to have some fun, look at the letters in the appendix of this book. Because I wrote Ronald Reagan a letter saying, everybody's saying that you are the biggest deficit spender of all time. But I figured out something here. And my partners at Arthur Anderson did the calculations and I took the, the, the four years of Carter, and your first four years, Mr. President, and by the way, this was published in the Wall Street Journal, and you're not the biggest deficit spender. It's Carter. Well, how could that be? Well, it is because we don't have a capital budget in the United States of America. So everything we spend on assets gets added to the deficit. It doesn't get put on the books as an asset and depreciated and allocated properly over generational use and paid over the generations that are using it. Every corporation has to do that. So I sent that in to the president, and lo and behold, it goes to Baker. Remember, he became his chief of staff. And one day, I'm on the floor of Congress. Who comes up to me? Dick Cheney. And you're going to see my letter to Dick Cheney in the back, 1987. He says, Joe. You know, they're very interested in what you said, but they don't really understand the difference between the accounting system that we're using and the one that... So I had to do four pages, Accounting 101, to go through the major items that affect the difference between government accounting and the cash basis that they were using. And then when I gave them a good answer, you'll see the OMB director, a CPA, a good man, Jim Miller, sending me another letter, three pages, and then ending, Joe, you know, as a practical matter, we can't do what you're saying. It'll make the deficit look bigger. I says, Jim, it's already bigger. You're papering over it. And that's exactly what they're doing in Washington all the time, papering over it. So I hope you will read this book. There are eight exciting chapter titles. The one on Social Security is Congressional Child Abuse, Send the Kids the Bill. 
I call it the biggest Ponzi scheme in the world. We're taking it from one generation and giving it to the other. Unfortunately, we're taking it from the future and spending it now. I don't know how we're going to get the money to really pay for it. But with that, I want to also, uh, in front of you, do you have the Association for Government Accountants? Was that handed out? Yes. Okay, read that. I was put in charge of a commission in 1993 by the major group in Washington and in the U.S. for government accounting. It's called the Association of Government Accountants because I was complaining so loud, they said, what can we do? I said, you can appoint a Blue Ribbon Commission and put me as chairman, and I'll get good people from around America, controllers from the various states, and we'll give you the answers as to what we have to do in Washington. There it is. Read it. Four pages. None of it has been implemented since 1993. Congressmen have gotten it, they probably just threw it away, figuring nobody's going to pay attention to this. And that's the issue. Can we become a constituency for this change? I'm giving this to you because I'd like you to send it to your congressman and your two senators, if you're from New York State. If you're not from New York State and you're in America, please send it to your representatives. With a note saying, I heard this guy, Joe Diaguardi, he says he's a former congressman and a CPA, and what he said made sense. And by the way, here's the commission he headed, and why haven't you adopted any of these? And does this mean we're going to have another bailout? Maybe Washington this time? So I think it's important that you get that message across. And I think that's what the Rotary is all about, you know, to get change. And that's why I'm here. Thank you very much. Great.